Welcome everyone to this Federalist Society virtual event as this afternoon, October 27, 2021, we're discussing the FTC in the current administration. The subtitle is Buckle Your Seatbelts. I'm Nick Marr, Assistant Director of Practice Groups here at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that expressions of opinion on today's call are those of our experts. We're very pleased to be joined by a terrific panel today. I'm going to just introduce our moderator. Many thanks to her for organizing this panel. And we're joined this afternoon by Ms. Svetlana Gans. She's a former chief of staff at the Federal Trade Commission. And she now serves on the, the sponsors of this event, the Corporation Securities and Antitrust Practice Group, as well as the Regulatory Transparency Project. So with that, Svetlana, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, Nick, and thank you to the Federalist Society for hosting this very informative and exciting and timely topic on FTC and the Biden administration. Um, as Nick said, I'm Svetlana Gans, and the views I express here today are my own and not necessarily of those of my employer or previous employers. I'm sure everyone will have the same disclaimer as we go through the event today. So I am pleased uh, to welcome you all to this session. Um, first, I will introduce our panelists, and then we will go to a moderated Q&A. I will be monitoring the chat feature of this call. So if you have a question, please put it in the chat and we will try to get to it during the course of our event. And uh, we also will have a few minutes at the end of the program to take audience Q&A as well. So first, let me start with introductions. Uh, I'd like to introduce Debbie Feinstein. She is a partner in Ar Arnold and Porter. Um, most recently, she served as the director of FTC's Bureau of Competition under President Obama from 2013 to 2017. And in that capacity, she oversaw the entire Bureau of Competition, including litigation and enforcement and policy matters. So Debbie, welcome. Next, we have Jessica Rich. Jessica Rich served at the FTC for over 26 years. Most recently, she served as the uh, director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection, where she oversaw all of uh, BCP's litigation and enforcement and policy matters, and also led the FTC privacy program. She's currently with Kelly Dry. Thanks, Jessica, for being here. Next, we have Adam Sella. He is an attorney advisor currently at the Federal Trade Commission, working with FTC Commissioner Christine Wilson, where he advises her on antitrust litigation and policy matters. Previously, Adam was in private practice as an antitrust attorney. So Adam, thank you so much for being here as well. So today's session will focus on the FTC and the Biden administration. Um, anyone reading the paper or the press knows that FTC has been very busy lately, both on the antitrust and consumer protection side. Um, they have been aggressive in terms of enforcement, but also rescissions of several bipartisan policy statements on both the consumer protection and the competition side. Um, they have also changed internal processes and procedures that we'll hear more about later today. While several of the priorities have come across multiple administrations, there are some new things at play at the FTC, and we will be discussing all of these new initiatives and priorities on the call today. So Debbie, let me first turn it over to you. Can you describe uh, current FTC priorities on the competition side? Uh, sure, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here um, with, this, uh, with this group, um, so thanks. Uh, it's an ambitious agenda. Um, it, you know, Chair Khan put out a letter basically setting forth uh, her priorities. I think the implementation of them uh, is, is exactly what we're all, we're all trying to figure out, you know, how some of these things will come about and what it is that it means in terms of specific uh, cases. I, I mean, it's clear that there's concern about mergers in general, sort of across the board, across industries, and looking carefully at those is something that I think we can expect. You know, we've already seen um, some of that. I think those of us um, in private practice have experienced an increase in the number of second requests issued. Uh, and we've seen letters issued at various times at the end of, of initial waiting periods, at the end of more, you know, fulsome investigations, reminding parties that they close at their, at their risk, essentially reminding people that there is no statute of limitations on the government going after um, uh, past transactions. Nothing new to that fact. That's been something that the agencies have in fact uh, done before, but um, you know, the spotlight on, on your deal when you get a, a letter is, is obviously something that people need to be 
uh, aware of. So that's clearly one priority, just the, the sort of concern about consolidation and, and, and dominance as, as they've said it in the, the industry. A second uh, objective is um, this issue of sort of dominant intermediaries um, and exactly what that means and which industries and what kind of um, entities within that I think is less clear in terms of what it means in terms of the enforcement action. One can certainly think of mergers in those kinds of, of industries, but whether it means other kinds of cases, whether it's monopolization cases or the like, uh, is a bit unclear. And then the third is various kinds of, of contract uh, provisions. Um, certainly, you know, non-competes and employment uh, contracts have been, has been an issue in both government and, and private um, litigation for quite some time. Uh, you know, how the focus on that will translate into enforcement. Um, you know, is, is to be seen, but I think, you know, she's, she's laid out uh, an, an ambitious uh, agenda, and I think we're all, you know, waiting to see how it actually gets um, affected in, in particular cases. Great. Thank you so much, Debbie. Um, Adam, um, where do you see antitrust priorities from your perch? Sure. Uh, and thanks. Thanks, Vetlana, and thanks for inviting me to this panel, and to Debbie and Jessica, I'm, I'm honored to be on a panel with such accomplished former FTC officials. And I should uh, say my disclaimer, the views I express are my own and not necessarily those of the commission or any individual commissioner. To be clear, only the chair knows for certain what will be prioritized at any given time. Debbie's description of the priorities in the memo basically covers what we know about the priorities, at least publicly. The priority that most jumped out at me was the first that Debbie mentioned regarding what the memo calls rampant consolidation. This priority addresses the increase in HSR merger filings or what commission leadership regularly refers to as the merger wave. The memo makes clear that the, review, the reviewing these filings is a priority over the work of offices of policy planning and the Office of International Affairs, whose staff the memo mentions has been working on merger review instead of the work of their respective offices. The memo also states a key project will be revising the merger guidelines. Obviously, the vertical merger guidelines have already been rescinded but the memo refers to, the, refers to the merger guidelines in general, suggesting that the horizontal guidelines are also on their way out the door. And finally, on this consolidation point, the memo states the need to deter unlawful transactions, which may or may not be limited to anti-competitive trans transactions, but also the memo states that we need to reduce the burden associated with investiga investigating and filing lawsuits. So we've already seen the foundation being laid in this deterrent strategy through statements about prior approval and the at least increased use of pre-consummation warning letters, among other changes to merger review. To focus on Commissioner Wilson's concerns, um, first, the chair, not Commissioner Wilson, sets the FTC agenda, but all commissioners can have a large impact on the FTC. Commissioner Wilson is certainly concerned about many actions being taken that may harm key aspects of sound antitrust enforcement this includes undermining the HSR process, which allows the business community to follow rules and timelines for merger review and allows the government to investigate mergers pre-consummation. Commissioner Wilson is also concerned about undermining the consumer welfare standard. These are all high level points that deserve more discussion, but one of Commissioner Wilson's biggest concerns that I really wanna flag is for staff and the FTC as a whole. It doesn't matter who's leading this agency, whether it is Chair Khan, you could bring in Jonathan Cantor, it could be Justice Brandeis himself. None of that matters if leaders do not have the incredibly knowledgeable and capable career staff to carry out the agency's mission. And news reports have revealed that staff are largely not allowed to participate in public events. I'm lucky that I report to Commissioner Wilson and she allowed me to be here. But really, you should be hearing from the staff in the merger shops, the conduct divisions, and the other offices and bureaus. It's those people that can inform the business community about illegal mergers and conduct and the policies and practices of the FTC so that businesses can follow the laws and avoid illegal actions in the first place. Commissioner Milson wants to make this clear so the FTC can continue to re retain, develop, and recruit lawyers and economists and other staff. If the FTC cannot retain its people, then it's not going to be a functional agency that can force the interest laws. 
Thanks so much, Adam. That's a really great point about FTC staff. They're the, the, the linchpin of the agency's good work. So thanks for noting that. Um, Debbie, I wanted to turn it back to you. I mean, you, you served at the FTC during the Obama administration and set policies and, and worked on enforcement matters for the agency. Do you feel that the um, FTC and the Biden administration on the antitrust side is different than what you experienced in the Obama administration? Yes and no. Um, I'll say it this way. So the first time I was at the FTC, it was during the first Bush administration. And from then, and then I came back, you know, some 20 plus years later um, uh, to work in the, um, uh, the Obama administration. And I would say for a very long period of time, it was pretty consistent. Um, and I don't think you'll find a commissioner who's ever served at the FTC who doesn't think, we ought to stop bad mergers. We ought to, you know, worry about dominant firms, uh, and we ought to worry about non-compete arrangements. I mean, just to pick a couple of things. I I, I can't imagine that there is a commissioner uh, who says, "Oh no, I didn't care about any of those things." So at that level, uh, I think there's quite consistency uh, in this. I can I can point to um, uh, recent commission actions before this administration in all of those areas. Uh, I think anybody who's ever sat in my chair will say that they tried to go after um, problematic transactions and agreements as, as aggressively as they could and as aggressively as the courts would allow. I think what's different um, uh, is two things. One is the rhetoric uh, in terms of um, uh, the way that, that, that these practices uh, are talked about. And second, some of the process steps that are being uh, implemented to try to address them. Uh, that's where I see a lot of the differences. Great, thanks for those views. Um, Jessica, let me turn over to you to talk a little bit about the BCP area focus of the FTC and the priorities there and how they may be different from um, when you were there last um, at the FTC. Right, well, thanks for having me. I echo the gracious remarks of everyone else being happy to be here with each other. Um, so in on the consumer protection side, in many ways, um, the topic areas are quite similar. Privacy, the tech platforms, behavioral advertising, dark patterns, algorithmic decision-making, discrimination, deceptive endorsements and earning claims, for-profit schools, these were all priorities of past leadership, which paved the way on these issues. So I think the current leadership would be horrified to hear that in many ways they're standing on our shoulders. Um, but the big focus besides rhetoric, as, as uh, Debbie um, mentioned, is on using new and existing tools, um, uh, new and maybe less used tools to get both to get monetary remedies in light of the ruling in AMG cutting back on, on redress and also um, to get stronger uh, conduct requirements too, if they can. Um, and a key thing here is a, a statement that there's gonna be a shift to rulemaking over more rulemaking, maybe less enforcement, which is interesting when you're a enforcement agency and not a regulatory agency, but um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But um, the current leadership clearly wants to expand existing rules. They issued a new interpretation of, a, of a, the health breach notification rule. They didn't even use rulemaking. They, they did it through a policy statement. Um, their COPPA, the safeguards rule, the business opportunity rule, they're all pending. They could have come out already, some of those, but they're, they're clearly working on them, I would say. Um, there's also talk about creating uh, new privacy rules under MAGMOS, which is a tall order. But again, um, a shift to rulemaking, and part of that is because you can get money under, under, um, under rules. Uh, they're making uh, aggressive use of civil penalty warning letters Right now, there have been 1,800 that have gone out um, and um, also making very strong demands for you know, monetary relief and, and injunctive relief in um, negotiations. Um, so far, I think we've seen lots of warnings, lots of rhetoric, lots of policy changes, but not a lot of cases on the consumer protection side or really a very low number of cases on the pr consumer protection side. And despite um, talk, this, 
the idea of a mag moss rulemaking being talked about on the consumer protection side for years now, not, we haven't seen one. Um, so that's very interesting. Um, so uh, echoing what Debbie said, it's an extremely ambitious agenda, uh, pushing the boundaries of their authority in certain ways. There are questions about what they can do with their existing authority and what they're going to do with their existing authority, but there'll be much to watch in the coming months. Great, thanks so much, Jessica. Um, Adam, let me turn it over to you. Both Jessica and Debbie spoke about procedural changes and process reforms at the agency, and I was hoping you could elaborate a little bit more on what that agency is doing here. Definitely. Well, starting off with the open commission meetings, uh, that's probably been the most public process change. There's now been four open meetings, which have allowed the commissioners to give short speeches, one after another, about topics on the agenda, and then the commissioners vote in public. Unfortunately, to avoid waiving a certain privilege, the commissioners and staff cannot have a dialogue or debate. So the public is seeing more of a prepared show than a constructive meeting. But on the clearly positive side, the public can sign up for a minute or two to speak to the commission. This part of the meeting has been incredibly informative and thought provoking and helpful as someone at the FTC. The, the last two meetings have also allowed staff to present their work on 6B studies. Specifically, the first presentation was on non-reportable acquisitions by five big tech companies. And the second was on privacy practices of six major ISP providers. I think it's been very beneficial for the public to be able to hear the results of those studies, at least so far from the staff that actually did the work. One concern about the meetings is the timing. Commentators and some commissioners have pointed out that only following the statutory minimum for informing the public of the agenda items really limits the ability of the public to analyze the issues and prepare written comments for consideration. Tight timelines have also limited the commissioner's ability to collect information, ask questions of staff, and work together to try and reach a bipartisan consensus on most of the issues. So there are definitely process concerns with these meetings. And as a result of the meetings, there have been process changes to the day-to-day -day functioning of the commission. For example, the broader use of omnibus resolutions, seven of which were passed at an open commission meeting. This has changed how compulsory process is used and how commissioners receive, or, or I should say, do not receive information about investigations. Additionally, the potential for broader use of prior approval has the potential to put even more power in the hands of the chair procedurally to block transactions without bringing an enforcement action and to withhold information from certain commissioners. And changes in procedure, as Jessica just talked about with rulemaking on the uh, petitions concerning for, for rulemaking that were voted out at a commission meeting, that will greatly impact the process um, as the FTC dives into that arena. There are also process changes that have been public re publicly reported that have nothing to do with commission votes. For example, Commissioner Wilson publicly acknowledged that she was not able to get second requests internally. A new process was later implemented to facilitate sharing of information within the FTC. I'd say that new process is in the works. Um, and one final example of process changes that we have uh, spoken about already or keep touching on is the pre-consummation warning letters. You know, this really single-handedly changes the HSR process from one with a 30-day waiting period or, or 60 days with a pull and refile, followed by second requests and time agreements to a process where investigations will not follow statutory timing or other agreements, instead create uncertainty through indefinite open-ended investigations. Now, now, the antitrust agencies have the ability to challenge consummated mergers, so these letters are not creating a new authority. And to the extent they become regular, ultimately, it's unclear if this has changed the process, and for it's unclear for the businesses and practitioners and the public if transactions that receive pre-consummation warning letters continue to actively be investigated, or if there's really any real meaning to, to what these letters do. 
Great, thank you so much, super helpful. Um, just to let the audience know, if you do have a question, please put it in the chat and I will try to get to it. So even though um, the FTC is an independent agency, the uh, Biden um, executive order on competition did identify a few areas of encouraging FTC activity, both with respect to enforcement and rulemaking. So I wanted to just throw it up to um, any of our panelists to opine on um, how the Biden executive order on competition may impact um, FTC priorities or missions. And I guess since it has competition in its title, I'll start with Debbie first and then go to Adam and then Jessica, if anyone wants to comment on that. Sure. So I think that the, you know, executive order, you know, reflects some of the uh, the issues that, that Chair Khan and others have, have raised out in public more generally. So I don't think it's just the executive order affecting the FTC. I suspect that, you know, some of the voices out there affected the executive order. Uh, you know, again, it's one thing to say I'm concerned about X. It's another thing to find a case before you where you can actually uh, take action. So, you know, every bureau director is asked, you know, what are, what are your priorities? Um, and, and, you know, the, the right answer probably ought to be to bring good cases and not bring bad cases and, and beyond that to, to see what the, the chair wants to do. But, you know, on the margin, there were things that I would have liked to do when I was there, find the right case to talk about what inappropriate information sharing was and wasn't in, in pre-merger due diligence because it's something that people, you know, worry about every day. But there just wasn't a case out there um, to, to bring. You know, you can't magically find the merger in front of you to basically bring a new theory or that sort of thing. Um, I think what it will translate into is just an, an extra focus on those sorts of, of issues um, in really being, you know, extra careful. And that's what I hear a lot that at both agencies, both DOJ and, and the FTC, everyone's just taking a, another look at things uh, to make absolutely sure they're not um, missing anything. And again, you know, whether it translates into different kinds of cases, you know, monopolization cases are hard to bring. And lots of leaders have come in. There was an AAG who famously said she wanted to bring 100 monopolization cases uh, uh, during the, the tenure there. And I remember talking to staff at the time who said, I'm not sure I can identify a hundred monopolies. Um, you know, I, I, where do I start uh, in terms of, of figuring out whether they're monopoly and whether they're taking, uh, you know, action that is monopolistic, monopolistic, right? You can't just say, I found a monopoly. I challenge you. You have to basically find something that is a violation under uh, uh, section two. So I think that it will, you know, impact sort of the general thinking, whether it will impact a particular case or cause somebody to bring a case that they otherwise might not have brought. Uh, that's a much harder question to me. Great. Thanks, Adam. Any views on the EO? Sure. As, as Debbie said, it's a little hard to know if the executive order is impacting the FTC or if other people impacted the executive order before it was released. Um, but apart from enforcement, which I think Debbie was really focused on, there are many areas where the executive order calls for rulemaking or guideline reconsideration or both. Uh, um, for example, we've already seen this start to play out in merger world uh, where the guidelines have been rescinded in the vertical merger guidelines and there's been statements about reconsidering the horizontal merger guidelines. This was called for uh, in the executive order, at least reconsideration and examination of those guidelines. Uh, the executive order also called for examining and using your power to go after consummated mergers. And again, we've seen increased use of these pre-consummation warning letters. Um, I think it's also interesting though, as, as Debbie spoke about enforcement, it's informative that the executive order downplays enforcement a bit, at least in certain topics, you know, hitting on the, guidelines uh, issue again, the executive order asked the FTC to look into the um, antitrust guidance for human resource professionals from 2016 uh, and also calls for rulemaking to protect American workers. The executive order really downplays, uh, you know, the, that the, those guidelines from 2016 make clear that naked no poach and similar agreements are per se illegal. Uh, it doesn't discuss the work of state attorney generals who have protected their citizens from illegal no-poach and non-compete agreements and 
the actions of state attorneys general in, in one state impacts the entire country in, in many of these circumstances. Um, now, all of this is just to say that the executive order is pushing rulemaking and new guidelines while at the same time downplaying the role of investigations and enforcement actions. Great, thanks for that. Jessica, the EO does, even though it says competition, it does talk a little bit about consumer protection, especially in the privacy area. What are your views on the impact of the EO on the BCP side? Well, when I saw it, I assumed like, like, like my colleagues that the FTC had a hand in writing it and in fact, two of the, the, the notable consumer protection issues, they overlap with competition, one of them does, um, privacy and right to repair are focused on. Uh, and that was all, those were already uh, uh, something that the FTC was focusing on. But interestingly, um, per Adam's comment, what the executive order calls for is rulemakings in both areas. And the FTC has not launched either yet. They've done some policy stuff in uh, right to repair, but they haven't launched rulemakings in either area. So that's that's kind of interesting. Great. Um, let's uh, go back to enforcement a little bit. Um, so Adam and his remarks talked about the new resolutions that the FTC voted out with respect to identifying several key enforcement priorities and potentially broadening the universe of conduct that could be investigated uh, during the resolution CID process. So Debbie, I wanted to turn to you just to give more context to these resolutions and how kind of what's the news there? Like how is it different than kind of what FTC has been doing um, earlier? Yeah, so usually it was a case by case decision uh, whether or not to issue process. The commission had to vote uh, on whether or not to issue uh, process and um, you had to have a, a majority to do it. Uh, and it meant that uh, the chair was somewhat limited in priorities if uh, he or she couldn't get additional commissioners on board. The only omnibus resolution I, I recall during my time was uh, to basically get certain data from states for hospital mergers, right? Everyone knew you needed that data. So it was, you know, if you want to look at a hospital merger, you don't have to come to us uh, to get a vote to basically get data. We know that you're going to ask for uh, in every case. And, you know, I think the reason that the, the commission, you know, always had that was, was twofold. One, to make sure that there was some bipartisan consensus uh, on bringing a, a case forward um, so that if not, one could discuss it because administrations change and it's not often uh, great to bring forward an investigation that's either going to be hotly disputed or that if there's a flip of the administration, staff will have spent a lot of time and effort on something uh, that might not come to fruition. So that was um, one reason. The second was to give visibility um, it gave visibility to the minority commissioners, all the commissioners, uh, as to what kinds of, of cases were, were going on. Um, now, uh, basically, it's, it seems like, you know, with an omnibus, you know, staff can do it and get subpoenas issued without, without that involvement of the additional uh, commissioners. So uh, it just takes that step out of the process. Um, you know, it's particularly relevant now when you've got a 2-2 a commission where some of these things might, you know, have had to wait otherwise um, uh, if they were hotly contested. One would hope that there weren't very many of those. And I would say in the time I was there, it was rare to have uh, uh, an investigation opened with compulsory process that all the commissioners didn't uh, agree on. It might take some persuading. It might take some discussions. It might take some, yes, I would support a case if. Uh, those were all really helpful things to know as, as staff um, uh, because you want to know whether or not you're going to get, you know, a, a, a 5 0 vote or whether you're not going to get uh, a 5 0 vote. One can debate about how much that might influence uh, a court. I had three, two decisions. Um, out of the commission and cases I won and 5-0 decisions out of the commission and, and the one case I, I, I lost um, when I was there that didn't get reversed on appeal was um, uh, was a 5-0 vote from the commission. So you can't always predict, but you know, people want bipartisan consensus when they can get it. And that early warning system of whether commissioners are concerned about an investigation from the get-go used to be really helpful to, 
uh, to have. The one thing that differentiates the FTC from, from DOJ, I think, is that built-in red team. I always used to call uh, uh, call some of the commissioners my built-in red team. Um, and why that's helpful is I always felt that if there were certain commissioners that I could convince to bring a case, I felt really good about my chances to convince a, a federal court judge. And, um, you know, not always true, but it certainly was was helpful. And I think it's that, that process um, is one of the reasons that you see the commission fare so well in the uh, the courts um, so often, you know, so many Supreme Court decisions uh, on antitrust on conduct cases have been brought by the FTC. And I think it's because of that, you know, bipartisan kind of working to get a case that we'll, we'll be able to put forward. Thanks so much, Debbie. So Adam, Commissioner Wilson dissented when the resolutions were um, voted on at the uh, one of the first open meetings. Can you describe um, kind of what Commissioner Wilson's concerns are and what you've been seeing to the extent you could share on that issue uh, since that, uh, I believe it was the July 1st meeting or, or one of the meetings. Sure, definitely. Uh, well, first, Commissioner Wilson's dissent noted that some of these omnibus resolutions may have had merit, but there were various issues with the resolutions and the process for the votes. For the first seven that came up for a vote, Commissioner Wilson was given fewer than five business days to consider their scope and content and to discuss with staff. The commissioners were also forced to vote on the resolutions as a package, seven in July and eight in September. So even if there was only one resolution that raised concerns, the only way to vote against it was to vote no on all of them. And Commissioner Wilson made clear that she was concerned that in the aggregate, these omnibus resolutions removed a lot of commissioner oversight from investigations without adequate justification. And I think Debbie's point was spot on here that having commissioners see the investigations or at least the idea and vote early on in the process should not be something that harms investigations. It actually will probably help strengthen the investigations to bring the vote, bring the ideas from five different people into the picture early on especially people from uh, different political parties. And, and Commissioner Wilson noted all of this and she had she let everyone know what her open questions and concerns were. were. And these questions included how investigations would be closed under this process, whether the language of the resolutions will lead to investigations outside the bounds of judicially recognized antitrust principles. And would these resolutions actually help staff conduct more efficient investigations? And just to hit that last point, a justification for the resolutions was the increase in merger filings that the agency is currently processing, but an increase in the workload did not seem like the right time to remove commissioner oversight. The opposite is probably true. Oversight can help ensure that work is done in an efficient manner. It, it's still unclear how omnibus resolutions have made investigations more effective or efficient, but it does mean less input and oversight from individual commissioners. I think it's pretty important to talk about it on the consumer protection side because it's different. So on the consumer protection side, as, as you know, Svetlana, um, the agency uses omnibus resolutions routinely. And I think maybe the difference just may be that there, there's um, many more cases on the consumer protection side, many of which involve routine fraud or, you know, and, and, and not, not deep policy issues. So you've got, you know, telemarketing, do not call, various different kinds of fraud, deceptive advertising and substantiation, different rules that are being reviewed, privacy. So regular use of omnibus resolutions, the issue, issuance of, of these, they may have had, were different topics, but it's, it's not different. It, it, it's really not a different process than the FTC has, has followed routinely. What the resolutions did do though, was flag some new priority areas, uh, or or at least existing priority areas that that Khan and 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 the majority uh, uh, were highlighting. So, order enforcement, platforms, cases involving um, armed services, veterans, kids, small business, bias in algorithms and biometrics, repair restrictions, and some others. So, it it highlights some priority areas. 
Great, thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to stick with enforcement and I, I network, I wanna be mindful of time because we have a lot of topics here. Um, both Debbie and, and Adam mentioned the rescission of the vertical merger guidelines. Interesting that only the FTC rescinded and DOJ did not. Um, and Adam mentioned maybe future work in the area of horizontal merger guidelines. I guess, um, you know, from Debbie and Adam's perspective, you know, what is the sense on what, what these vertical merger guidelines or potential horizontal merger guidelines, what, you know, what are they going to say and, and how will they change um, the course of antitrust practice going forward? Debbie, I don't know if you want to take that and then Adam, up to you guys. I'm, Adam, you want to go first? You want me to? Go ahead. Go ahead, Debbie. Okay. So on the vertical merger guidelines, it was no surprise, uh, given the dissents of Commissioner Slaughter and Chopra. You know, we all knew that this was coming and I think had been advising our clients uh, accordingly for quite some time. I think what you'll see in the vertical guidelines is something that looks much more like, you know, what their concerns were, were in, in the, the dissents. Um, no safe harbor, um, uh, you know, taking out the concept that most, uh, uh, vertical mergers are, are, are pro-competitive and further refinement of the circumstances in which the elimination of double marginalization uh, ought to be counted. So I think, and, and perhaps some discussion of, of remedies and what appropriate remedies are in vertical uh, mergers. Um, I think that's, you know, probably the, the issues that are being um, thought about. Um, in horizontal mergers, I suspect that um, much of the thought will be whether or not the concentration levels are too high uh, and whether they should be going back to, you know, uh, the numbers in the 1992 merger guidelines or even yet uh, different numbers. I think there could be, based on what folks are talking about, more on whether there's a trend to concentration in the industry more on how many competitors ought to be uh, in a market um, along with just HHI numbers, just this general sense that, you know, there's been this movement too far. Uh, you know, now what's interesting is, is will the courts accept it, um, right? They're the, they're the wild card uh, in all of this. And, you know, over time, the, the, the courts have to some extent um, followed the merger guidelines. It often takes them a little while. It's not an immediate uh, reaction, but over time, um, on the other hand, uh, you know, there's lots of debate over what the market is and how to measure shares and all of those things are going to continue even if the guidelines change at the end of the day, a federal court judge has to be uh, persuaded that a transaction is, is anti-competitive and the guidelines alone um, won't enable those, uh, those um, cases to be made if the other evidence isn't there. But uh, I do think there's going to be a move to kind of move back to some of the, the older antitrust cases, which required much less low, lower levels of concentration um, uh, to be challenged. And I'll just real quickly, uh, on the vertical merger guidelines, it'll be fascinating to see. I think Debbie accurately described all of the issues on the margins that are up for debate um, between both sides of this debate. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how much further the, the eventual guidelines go beyond what current case law says. Um, Professor Salop has proposed vertical merger guidelines that he really likes to tweet about that I suggest everyone check to see what maybe is a possibility. Um, they're out there for people to read. And then on the same point on the horizontal merger guidelines, it'll be fascinating to see what happens there. Um, some people have proposed and discussed looking at the 1968 merger guidelines. If you haven't read those recently, I think you should. Um, there's many thresholds in there. One of the thresholds is challenging an acquisition in a less highly concentrated market. If a firm with 5% market share is going to acquire another firm with 5% market share, that would be an extremely different uh, posture for the agencies to take. But as Debbie noted um, at the end of her comments just then, the 2010 guidelines have had a, a extreme impact on courts and they've been very influential. We'll see if new guidelines that might have incredibly low thresholds will ultimately have the same impact on enforcement. 
Great. Thanks so much, Adam. Um, let me just turn to you on the consumer welfare standard. I think one of the major motivations of pulling the unfair massive competition policy statement was its focus on consumer welfare. And can you discuss a little bit about um, Commissioner Wilson's views on con cons consumer welfare and, and maybe Debbie, um, just briefly, kind of what the practical ramifications are for companies if, if the agency kind of moves beyond consumer welfare and its enforcement. So Adam, let me turn to you first. Sure. I'll just highlight two points on the consumer welfare standard, and that's that it's administrable and it's not all about prices. Those are the two points that are consistently misconstrued by critics of the the standard. Um, there's a desire to insert non-competition issues into antitrust analysis right now, inserting goals that should generally be important for the government to worry about, like preserving jobs, focusing on sustainability, helping small businesses. That will all make antitrust less administrable and less predictable. If we want to have antitrust enforcement that protects competition, we can't bring non-competition goals into this analysis. That's because the pursuit of multiple goals will always require trade-offs and trade-offs will allow antitrust enforcers to weigh the goals in a subjective way, leading political whims and influence uh, uh, politicians to dictate antitrust considerations. For example, what do you do with a merger that will increase innovation and lower costs to consumers, but their concerns about the impact on the environment or what do you do with a merger that will decrease innovation and raise costs, but the merger will create a lot of jobs? These other goals should be left to the appropriate sectoral regulators or to democratically elected representatives to address those problems. And my second point, the consumer welfare standard is not only a consideration of low prices. The consumer welfare standard seeks to maximize consumer surplus. Any judge or enforcer can apply the standard. If prices increase for an otherwise unchanged product, consumer welfare is harmed. If quality decreases, lowering the amount a consumer is willing to pay, consumer welfare is harmed. If innovation is stalled and a consumer will be delayed in buying a new product, consumer welfare is harmed. I could go on with these examples. Ultimately, the consumer welfare standard works to keep prices low, increase output, promote competition, increase innovation, and protect consumers. If you bring non-competition concerns into the picture, the balancing of goals that will ensue will lead to unpredictable results. Great, thank you. Debbie, what, what, what are you seeing on the, on the kind of counseling practical side on kind of deviating from the consumer welfare standard? I think we don't know how it will be done yet. So right now, uh, I agree that, that what I've encouraged clients is to recognize that consumer welfare is, is broader than just will prices go up. Um, and it does have things like, you know, will there be, you know, oligopsony effects on employees? Um, uh, I, yeah, I hear that question a lot. I, I always ask the question. I have yet to see the hypothetical. The only thing I've ever heard an enforcer say is imagine a situation where you've got two plants that hire some kind of specialized labor on Hawaii in Hawaii. And the market is for the output of those plants is a nationwide market, but uh, the, you know, they're the only two employers on the island who hire that kind of employee. You could imagine that there's no downstream harm, but there is, you know, upstream harm because uh, maybe for a 5% reduction in salary, people aren't gonna move off the island. Okay, that's a, that's a great hypothetical. It feels a little bit like a law school exam. Um, not sure how much real world application uh, it has, but I do tell clients to you know, think about it and be prepared to get a lot of questions on it. Beyond that, I agree. I don't know how to make the trade-offs and the, the agencies have been quite clear in telling other jurisdictions around the world that they should not let these kinds of policy considerations uh, in. You go look at OECD papers that the Department of Justice and the FTC um, have written and, and speeches that have been given um, about, about China and whether you know industrial sorts of goals should um, filter into antitrust and how difficult that makes it. 
you know, when I was at the agency, I, I worried that we didn't have labor economists. You'd have to have a completely different kind of workforce to address um, some of the questions that are being uh, uh, addressed if you're going as far as uh, basically saying we're going to make these trade-offs. That's very different than saying, hey, look, if a particular merger is going to reduce, you know, competition along privacy dimensions, along innovation dimensions, uh, along data dimensions. Absolutely, those are all fair game. Uh, and I think there's a lot of room, but if you're going beyond that, then I think you're talking about sort of the moral equivalent of a domestic Scythius, uh, which you could certainly, you know, if the White House wanted to say, you know, I'm gonna do something like uh, the telecom task force, uh, or like we do CFIUS, which is a committee that brings together people, a committee that brings together the FTC and the Labor Department and the like to opine collectively on whether a merger is, is problematic. Um, you know, that's absolutely something for, for Congress to, to decide. Uh, I think it's hard to do that all within a single agency. Great, thanks. Uh, Jessica, let me turn over to you. Debbie mentioned kind of the interplay uh, between competition and consumer protection. And there was a recent uh, staff memo that Chair Khan distributed saying that she's hopeful to break down the silos between BC and BCP and integrate them more uh, within the commission's work. And I was just curious on your take on the practical implications of that staff memo. So I personally agree with the goal, at least in the privacy and technology areas where the issues are either intertwined or actually in conflict. Um, and they need to be at least explained because there's a lot of confusion as we were just talking about, about um, whether you should address some of these non-competition issues in competition. So I think the agency has a rare ability with both a competition side and a consumer protection side to at least bring it together and provide greater, greater clarity to the public. And I wrote about this in Brookings uh, last March. Um, however, breaking down the silos has been a really elusive goal for like decades. And unless Khan is planning to do some sort of structural changes or organizational changes, this is gonna be really hard. Um, and it also, it's gonna be hard anyway. This is hard because there are, the competition has one set of laws and consumer protection has another. And you can't just throw the laws together and conflate the remedies. And I think there's a lot of that going on. Um, and even Khan in, her own, in the memo where she laid this out was talking at, at cross purposes about the issue. On the one hand, she condemned privacy practices that block data collection by competitors. She said, oh, there's privacy practices that are used as a pretext for anti-competitive behavior. And on the other hand, she condemned commercial surveillance. Um, and those goals are kind of in conflict and she just put one in one part of the memo and the other in another part of the memo. So I think this is challenging, but I, uh, um, but I, I, I do agree with the, the overall goal. Yeah. Debbie, did you wanna say a few things? Yeah, I would, I would add, th this is something that every chair has, has hoped that we would talk to each other um, and make sure that we were aligning on things. And, and certainly Jessica and I did. We had known each other before we were at the uh, commission. So it, it gave us, and he had both worked um, uh, as staffers, Jessica continuously, uh, I for a, uh, you know, a brief stint, but we had both been uh, you know, staffers and, and then later um, managers. And so we were, you know, more than happy to have opportunities to, to be in a room together and to talk about these issues. I mean, you do have to recognize that there are some conflicting goals. Um, my favorite was, I think the first time I was at the FTC, I remember my, my boss saying, you got to go figure out what BCP is doing. Because I just heard they're going to get a bunch of competitors in a room and agree not to do a certain kind of advertising. And I'm not so sure that's something that ought to be happening in this building. Go figure it out. Um, that's self-regulation. 
Right. And there's a way to do it. And there's a way that, 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 you know, not to do it, but, but it's just an example of, you know, where does the line between self-regulation and an anti-competitive agreement not to compete, you know, where are those lines drawn, you know, BCP might've been perfectly happy for an anti-competitive agreement on limiting, you know, advertising to occur while uh, the, the, the competition side might not have been so happy. You know, how do you deal with those kinds of, you know, clearly conflicting, um, uh, goals. And then the second thing is, you know, there are different laws. And I think there's a sense of, um, you know, trying to, uh, you know, add ornaments on the, uh, on the Christmas tree, you know, uh, equivalent of, you know, provisions in a consent when you don't have a legal basis to do so uh, is something that is, is troubling to folks. So simply because you have a merger uh, involving a company that has you know, basically violated a consumer protection law, are you going to be able to add certain, you know, fencing in kinds of provisions uh, that you might like to get for the consumer protection side, if you know that a judge would never order that uh, if the matter were to go to litigation, you know, how hard do you push it? Those are the kinds of considerations you have to think about, uh, you know, even if everybody on both sides agrees that is a laudable goal, there's a lot of implementation issues that you have to think about uh, uh, as well. All right, thanks so much, uh, Debbie and, and Jessica. I did have a question from the audience and I know we're close to time and I have a few more questions, but um, Debbie or Adam, the question from the audience is, can you please comment on the demise of the HSR early termination period? When will it ever, when will we ever see it again? <laughs> I'll go first, cause I'll, I'll be brief. Um, because the easy short answer is I don't know when early termination will come back. Um, it, it, I think it's almost nine months now. It was, we were told it was brief and temporary. So it's sounding more permanent or at least not brief and temporary. Um, we don't know when it will come back. And of course, as we've all mentioned, at least Debbie and I have both mentioned the pre-consummation warning letters even start to question that 30 day time period. Um, so yeah, the, I think the, what was the question, the demise of the HSR process, we're all, all sitting waiting uh, to get more information about um, the, the fate of HSR. Debbie, anything to add to that? All right. Oh, Adam said it perfectly. All right, so wait and see, I guess. Um, Jessica, let me turn over to you. you. You started to say in your introductory remarks uh, the fact that the FTC is starting to use some underutilized tools in its tool shed. And one specific thing you mentioned was the Civil Penalty Offense Authority, um, which might be new to a lot of folks on the call today. So I was wondering if you could elaborate more on what that authority is and how the FTC is, is using that authority. So with, um, as you note, uh, the curtailment of redress under uh, in the wake of AMG and the fact that the FTC already has very limited civil penalty authority. The FTC is trying to revive one of its lesser used tools, which is under Section 5M1B, um, the FTC can get penalties against companies uh, that have actual knowledge as their practices were found illegal in a prior administrative litigated administrative action against another company. And the FTC establishes knowledge by sending warning letters to, to companies with copies of these prior litigated orders and summaries. So um, the FTC has now used these letters in 1800 instances. Um, the, yesterday was a whole other 1100 in uh, for-profit schools, in um, uh, deceptive um, endorsements and now in uh, deceptive earnings claims. And um, I think, um, you know, these letters haven't been used for, for a bunch of reasons. The, I think the main reason the letters hadn't been used so much is um, that the FTC until AMG thought it had 13B authority. And of course, redress is always the first choice. You wanna give money back to consumers rather than get it as penalties and send it over to treasury. So as long as the FTC had this authority, it didn't need to look for that much for other opportunities for, for money. 
But there's also a lot of legal concerns raised by this approach. Um, first, um, will the Supreme Court that just struck down um, the uh, redress authority in AMG um, view this as an attempt to circumvent rulemaking, which is the main way the FTC establishes standards across the industry. Remember, we're talking 1800 letters here and get civil penalties. So I think there's a strong argument. This is an, an attempt to get around rulemaking authority. Um, some, warn, some of these warning letters are from the 1950s. Some of them may actually be earlier. And are, are they, is that sufficient to put companies on notice of what, uh, what practices are illegal today? You know, a lot has changed in the law, including by the way, there's a deception and unfairness statement got written, which have now been picked up in, in the law. Um, and you know, some of the cases that have been in the summarizing these letters don't have findings that, that and, and, and the, the law requires they have specific findings. And then um, finally, when the commission litigates these cases, it's gonna need to show that whatever conduct the current companies are engaged in is the same conduct that's you know, cited in these letters. Um, and, and of course the FTC is gonna have to investigate a whole lot of companies to, you know, these are warnings, they're not cases yet. So all of that, there's, there's a whole lot here to watch as we move forward. Great, thank you. Um, I, we did wanna hit on rulemaking, but given the time and we do have one audience question, um, if folks on the phone are interested in FTC rulemaking, I'll be moderating another panel next Tuesday at noon, specifically focused on FTC rulemaking, both on the consumer protection and the competition side. So please, uh, register for that event. But with uh, given the time, I did want to ask an audience question. I guess, Adam, let's see if you could answer this. And if not, we'll turn it over to Debbie. Um, the, an the question is, is BC staff reviewing all prior PO HSR informal interpretations? Anything you could let us know about that would be great. Well, I'll go quickly again and, and happy to send this one to Debbie um, if she can opine on it. I assume this question is in response to the, I believe it was a blog post that talked about using, considering debt in HSR filings and threatening warning uh, HSR practitioners uh, not to follow those in informal interpretations and then comment about the risk of following informal interpretations and uh, mentioned that there would be a review. You know, Debbie started this entire panel stock talking about a very ambitious um, uh, goals and visions for this agency. You know, add reviewing all informal interpretations and deciding whether they're good or bad to that very ambitious agenda. I I wouldn't hold my breath for uh, all of those to be reviewed. Um, I think it's smart to trust staff in the PNO who are experts and let them guide HSR practitioners to make this a, a very efficient process so that we get uh, mergers filed that actually need to be filed. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll pass it to Debbie to, uh, to comment on the HSR process. Yeah, there have been a number of um uh, withdrawals uh, and, you know, indications that things are under consideration. Um, you know, the good news is that the p &O staff does respond pretty quickly um, uh, to them, but I think there is some sorting out to do on certain topics, but I don't have the sense that they're going back and looking at everyone. It has long been uh, p and lore that you rely on an overly long um, uh, long ago uh, informal interpretation at your peril. And so it's been regular practice for people just to flip a quick note. Hey, it is, you know, informal interpretation, you know, 973, uh, you know, still, still good interpretation and, and the commission staff will tell you, you know, yes or no. And sometimes legitimately there are, are reasons that things change. So I think they're trying to work through it. I, I do have the sense that, that, um, uh, they've been asked to look to see whether there are some loopholes that are um, uh, not requiring filings that should be made. 
Great, thank you. So given that I am a BCP attorney at heart, I will have the last question go to Jessica. Um, so we talked a little bit about FTC rulemaking. Obviously, there's been a lot of changes on the procedural side with respect to MAGMA's procedural reforms at the agency. And I just wanted to, to turn to you, Jessica, if you could kind of talk to us about your reading the tea leaves on what might be in queue in terms of FTC, BCP related rulemaking at the FTC. Well, as I mentioned, there are COPPA and safeguards are actually pending. Um, there's reviews of health breach notification and, um, and uh, uh, business opportunity and probably others. And those are APA rules. And uh, the FTC should have the, should, should, is probably likely to want to push out uh, APA rulemaking. There's talk about a broad privacy rule under Mag Moss which frankly, I think is just impossible. MAGMAS is a very cumbersome process for each mandate within a rule and for a broad privacy rule, there could be hundreds. They have to prove unfairness, deception, prevalence, and then there's all sorts of procedural obstacles and no deference in court review. So if the FTC does rules in privacy, I would think they would tackle narrower issues like that are priorities, dark patterned, algorithmic decision-making, data security, which is broad, but there's precedent there. Um, what the FTC is calling commercial surveillance, which is behavioral advertising, um, it would still be tough under MAGMOS, but much more manageable than some broad uh, privacy rule uh, that would really be impossible. Great. So with that, I wanted to thank everyone for a magnificent program today. Debbie, Adam, Jessica, it was so great to be with you again on this Zoom. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your words of wisdom. Um, and thanks again for Nick Marr for all his work and the Federalist Society for hosting us today. So with that, I think uh, we will adjourn this session.